think you're going to find this one pretty interesting today as well as, in some cases, pretty horrifying for some of the things that happened to young women. But it was a time to, for us to focus on this. So I am delighted to introduce you to Yasmin Vafa, and I'll give you her bio in just a minute. But she's the coordinator, co-founder and executive director of Rights for Girls, and is going to talk about the pervasive gender-based violence that occurs in the United States and how marginalized girls and young women that experience for them is just all too often leads right into criminal justice involvement. They didn't start it, but that seems to be where they ended up. Um, as I said, she's the co-founder of this human rights organization working to end gender-based violence and sex traffic in the U.S. Her work and her advocacy focuses on the intersections between race, gender, violence, and the law. She educates the public and particularly policymakers on these issues and how the issues affect the lives of marginalized women and girls. She has successfully advocated for the passage of key anti-trafficking laws at the federal level that are designed and implemented a national training program for judges on child trafficking. And she has co-authored a seminal report that maps girls' unique pathways into the criminal justice system. The sexual Abuse to Prison Pipeline, The Girl's Story, in 2016, the U.S. Congressional Victims of Right Caucus honored Yasmin for their lowest, with their Lois Hate Award of Excellence and Innovation for her leg legislative advocacy on behalf of these young women. We're delighted you're with us today, um, and you have a significant number of young men and young women in this audience to talk to. Thank you all very much for coming today, and be sure you keep, have questions in your mind because we, we like this exchange and interaction with the students and faculty and staff. Yasmin? So thank you all for the opportunity to be here today. It's a real pleasure for me to be able to talk to you a little bit about our work at Rights for Girls, and particularly to shed light on an issue that we think is of grave importance to the lives of so many young women and girls, and particularly young girls of color throughout the United States. Um, in today's presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we mean when we refer to the abuse to prison pipeline, um, why it exists, who it disproportionately affects, and talk about strategies to dismantle the pipeline. So at Rights for Girls, we work to confront the staggering rates of sexual violence facing young women and girls in the United States today. Uh, we know that violence against women and girls is incredibly pervasive, with rates rivaling those of developing countries. Uh, we know from the CDC that nationally one in four American girls will experience some form of sexual violence before reaching the age of 18. And I think what became very troubling to us as an organization is when we realized that for girls who come from economic means or stable homes and families, when they experienced abuse or gender-based violence, they were uh, in a much better position to be able to access the services and interventions that they need to effectively heal. But for girls at the margins, and by that we mean our girls who come from impoverished communities, our girls who face multiple forms of adversity, like um, sexism, racism, and other forms of adversity, these girls, the experience of sexual violence can actually land them behind bars. And so this became a concept that we began to talk about in our work, in our advocacy, as the abuse to prison pipeline. And so, quite simply, the abuse to prison pipeline is a term to describe the pathways of gender-based violence that land girls, and particularly girls in the justice system um, here in the United States. And so I know recently there's been a lot of conversation around juvenile justice reform. Um, those who are active on these issues have probably heard a lot about what's known as the school to prison pipeline that really centers on the lives of young men and boys of color. But for us, it was incredibly important to illuminate the hidden lives of girls behind bars and what it was that was actually fueling their justice involvement. And so in 2015, we released a report known as the Sexual Abuse to Prison Pipeline, The Girl's Story, with our partners at the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and the Ms. Foundation to really uh, name this pipeline for girls and to map key points in this trajectory and offer policy recommendations to end this pipeline for good. So we know that girls of color are not only uh, marginalized in our communities and society, but they're also marginalized by the system. In our report, we focused predominantly on black girls, Latina girls, and Native American young women and girls. And we found that girls of color only account for about 22% of the general youth population, but they represent 66% of incarcerated girls. We also know that black girls are three times as likely to be referred to court than their white peers. 
Black and Native American girls are 20% more likely than white girls to be formally petitioned when they do appear before the juvenile court. And Native American girls who face the highest rates of incarceration of any ethnic or racial group are five times more likely than their white peers to be confined to a detention facility. Though we know that the overall rates of youth detention and incarceration have been steadily declining over the past two decades, that's not been true for our girls. In fact, what we've been able to see is the girls are now the fastest growing segment of our juvenile justice population, and their share of uh, justice involvement is rising at every point of intake, so from arrest to adjudication to secure confinement. So what's fueling this increase? Well, we know that girls are not becoming increasingly violent. Uh, in fact, girls still only account for about 10% of violent offenses. But what we found in our research was that sexual abuse was actually a primary predictor of justice involvement in girls. And so what we began to realize through the different um, research and, and state data that we were able to uncover about girls in the justice system was that our girls are actually being criminalized for their experiences and their responses to trauma. So what else do we know about girls in the juvenile justice system? Well, we know that these girls suffer really high rates of depression and PTSD. Um, many of them, if not most of them, have been victims of childhood sexual abuse, and they experience disproportionate rates of ACEs, or adverse childhood experiences. Uh, for those who are not familiar with ACEs or the ACEs study, um, these are indicators uh, that children experience during the course of adolescence that can actually, in the aggregate, go on to negatively impact um, their health com outcomes in adult and so we know that girls in the juvenile justice system are nearly twice as likely to report having an ACEs score of five or higher than boys. And going back to the issue of sexual abuse, we know that girls uh, experience sexual abuse four times higher rate than their, their male counterparts. And so again, from the data that we were able to uncover, and unfortunately much of the data around children in the juvenile justice system is not disaggregated by things like race, ethnicity, and gender. So from the limited data that we were able to see, both nationally as well as state level data, we were able to conclude that an overwhelming majority of girls behind bars across the United States have histories of childhood sexual and physical abuse. So nationally, 73% of girls in the juvenile justice system have reported experiencing some form of abuse, and that's before they even enter the system. So when we drilled down on the state data, we found that those percentages were even more alarming. Uh, in South Carolina, for instance, 81% of girls behind bars there reported past histories of sexual abuse. In California, 81% of girls in the juvenile justice system reported histories of physical or sexual abuse. 84% uh, of girls in Florida who were in the justice system reported being victims of family violence and domestic violence. And in Oregon, a staggering 93% of girls reported experiencing physical and sexual abuse before coming into the system. So when you look at these incredibly high rates of trauma, together with the offenses that girls are most often criminalized for, it becomes very clear that our girls are actually being punished precisely because of the abuse that they've suffered. So the most common offenses for girls when you look across the United States are running away, truancy, prostitution, and substance abuse. And it's no coincidence that these are all behaviors that either strongly are correlated with trauma or experiencing trauma or coping with trauma. Um, you know, when a girl doesn't have uh, resources and is facing abuse at home, um, her form of self-preservation is to run. Um, similarly, girls who don't have access to services and interventions may self-medicate through the use of drugs and alcohol. And so it makes sense when you look at these offenses together with the rates of trauma that our girls are actually being criminalized because of this. So here are just some examples of the pipeline, and our report really drills down on these examples in more detail. But just to give you an idea, we're talking about the young girl in foster care who's being abused by her caretaker, who um, is either not believed when she reports or um, feels too much shame to report, and so as a means of escaping the violence, runs away. Uh, well, that girl faces uh, the status offense of running away and can be arrested for that offense. Similarly, a girl in school who's facing harassment or violence who decides that she can't um, get support from any of trustworthy adults or guidance counselors or teachers, um, well, she may decide to start skipping school, again, as a means of self-preservation. Well, these girls, we find too often, are arrested for truancy. And finally, I think one of the more glaring examples of the pipeline is the arrest and incarceration of victims of domestic child sex trafficking for prostitution offenses throughout the country. 
And so now I'm just going to take a few moments to talk about sex trafficking of youth in particular, because I think it warrants uh, a little bit of discussion. Um, what do we actually mean when we talk about domestic child sex trafficking? Well, if you haven't heard that term, you might have referred, um, heard this population be referred to as underage um, sex workers, teen sex workers, juvenile or child prostitutes. Um, these are all terms that really define this population of victims who are bought and sold for sex uh, across the country. Um, these are terms that we generally try try to stay away from for reasons that I'll explain in a moment. Uh, another term that you might have heard used to describe this population is survival sex. This is a phrasing that we typically hear amongst our runaway and homeless youth and in those advocacy circles, and it really tries to describe children who um, need to trade sex with adults to meet their basic needs. But importantly, under the law, and under the federal law in particular, these children do fall under the umbrella of domestic child sex trafficking. The last two terms are used quite often very interchangeably with domestic child sex trafficking. The first, commercial sexual exploitation of children, or what you'll often hear referred to as CSEC, is something that we've heard for a long time. Many of our friends out on the West Coast who've been working on this issue for decades usually use this terminology and it's interchangeable with domestic child sex trafficking as is domestic minor sex trafficking or DMST. So why are we harping on language? Why is it even important to talk about the importance of the language and the words that we use to describe this population? Well, at Rights for Girls, we believe very strongly that how we are named is how we are treated. And so it's really critical to be on the same page about the language that we use to describe uh, the violence and exploitation that really colors uh, so many of these girls' lives. When we use terms like child prostitute or teen sex worker, it evokes a very different image um, to society, to the media, and to others than when you talk about victims of child sex trafficking. And so we feel that it's not only um, a way of honoring the experiences of survivors, but it's also a way of being very clear and not masking or normalizing the extreme levels of violence that so many of these girls experience. So what do we know about trafficked youth in the United States? Well, for many, many years when we talked about domestic child sex trafficking or domestic sex trafficking in general, we assumed that it referred to bringing foreign nationals into the United States who were then trafficked um, for sex or for labor. And it took many years for us to recognize that, in fact, American-born citizens uh, and LPRs were also being exploited for sex. And we know this is particularly true around victims of sex trafficking and, of course, our youth. Most of these victims are U.S.-born. Uh, and current data suggests that the majority of them come directly from our child welfare system. So nationally, about 60% of all identified victims of domestic child sex trafficking come from our foster care system or come from group homes or congregate care facilities. Again, when we looked at the states, we saw intersections that were even more glaring than the national data. So in Connecticut, for example, over 90% of their identified victims of child sex trafficking were not only American-born, but almost all of them had been in their child welfare system, and, and particularly in foster care placements. New York had similar numbers. Over 80% of their trafficking victims had histories of child welfare involvement. Uh, and in that state, they were predominantly in the case of abuse or neglect proceedings. Uh, in Alameda County, which is the area around Oakland, a one-year review of local trafficking populations found that over 50% of them came directly from our child welfare system. And I'm going to share a story from a young survivor who we've had the privilege of working with for the last several years, um, because I think that she really powerfully interstates this intersection better than uh, any of these stats could. And so this is a young woman who was born in Oakland, California. She was essentially placed into foster care at a very young age. Um, and she was subsequently lured by a trafficker uh, who promised to love and take care of her and was exploited throughout the West Coast of the United States from the ages of 10 to 17. And so what this young woman told us was that she believed foster care in many ways was the perfect training ground uh, for a transition into a life of sex trafficking. And she said this was the case because it was in foster care throughout her 14 different placements where she first recognized and internalized the duality of being cared for by her caretaker and being abused by the adults entrusted to care for her. And it was in also in foster care that she first internalized the concept of being tied to money and being a source of income for her foster family. And so those two realities ingrained in her from such a young age, basically since the day she was born, uh, made the transition into a life of sex trafficking with her trafficker, who also regularly abused her, who also relied on her to meet a quota and to bring that into what they call their stable of girls, a really seamless transition. And so we found that this was a really profound statement. And, um, 
Uh, it's something that's really inspired all of our greater work around child welfare reform uh, and really helped recognize the unique vulnerabilities of girls and foster care youth in particular uh, to trafficking. When talking about child, domestic child sex trafficking in the United States, we also cannot ignore the glaring racial and gender disparities. Uh, we know that globally, women and girls of color are overrepresented in the commercial sex trade as a whole, and this is true for a variety of reasons. But in the United States, not only are these women and girls more likely to be exploited for sex, they're also more likely to be criminalized for their exploitation. So some of the stats that really drive that point home, uh, we know that 78% of all juvenile prostitution arrests involve girls. Um, when you apply a race lens to that data, we see that the majority of them, over 52%, are African American children. And this is more than any other racial group. But it's important to recognize that even in jurisdictions that we consider to be some of the most enlightened, and these are jurisdictions that are no longer arresting or prosecuting their child victims of sex trafficking for prostitution or other offenses, um, they're still seeing a glaring overrepresentation of girls of color, and particularly black girls, amongst trafficked youth. And so an example of that is King County, Washington, which is the area in and around Seattle. Um, they have ceased all charges against children who are victims of trafficking. Um, since 2009. And so these children are no longer being arrested, but despite that fact, African Americans in that county comprise less than 7% of the overall population, but they're still being identified as over 40% of victims who are trafficked. And so that's still really staggering and an important case to note, because it's not just the criminal justice involvement that's creating these racial disparities, it's merely the fact that a lot of these marginalized communities are being targeted. So despite the fact that we know these are some of our most vulnerable children, they come from foster care, they've dealt with all forms of adversity, each year more than 700 children are arrested for prostitution in the United States. And I just want to flag this number. This is a very low estimate. This is uh, the federal data that's collected from states who are voluntarily reporting their juvenile arrest data, so we believe the actual number to be much higher. But even still, even though the federal law makes clear these kids are victims of trafficking, even though many of these states, if not most of them, have age of consent laws that uh, make it clear that these kids aren't even old enough to be having sex, let alone uh, selling sex, um, 700 kids are arrested on an annual basis at the very least. And so here I've just flagged the federal law, the federal law that really governs our overall response to human trafficking in the United States is the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, or the TVPA. And under this law, any minor under the age of 18 that exchanges sex for anything of value is considered a victim of a severe form of trafficking in persons. And so again, going back to the terminology that we discussed before around survival sex, um, it's clear that this definition encompasses those youth because there doesn't need to be a trafficker or other third party exploiter. The mere fact that a child is exchanging sex to meet a basic need uh, constitutes trafficking under the federal definitions. So to date, 34 states still allow for children to be arrested and prosecuted for prostitution offenses. And of course, there's devastating consequences associated with this, mainly that girls and other trafficked youth continue to be arrested and incarcerated for, in fact, being victims of human trafficking, uh, which also means that they're stuck with long-term adjudication and arrest records that then go on to impede their ability to access you know, meaningful uh, access to education, housing opportunities, uh, as well as uh, jobs. So once any victim of the abuse to prison pipeline actually enters the juvenile justice system and enters detention, it's important to be clear about the different obstacles that they're facing. These girls are navigating a punitive system that's been largely designed for men. They're subject to degrading and harmful conditions of confinement that can really exacerbate their existing trauma. Um, some of the very routine procedures that we see in the juvenile justice system, like um, strip searches, uh, the use of restraints, uh, methods of isolation, all of these things are traumatic for any child. But think of how particularly harmful these types of routine operating procedures are for victims of commercial sexual exploitation or girls who have been subject to other forms of sexual violence. The juvenile justice system lacks gender responsive and trauma informed interventions. And of course, these children all have to deal with not only the stigma of arrest, but the long term negative impacts of it. 
So I think it's safe to say that our current criminal and juvenile justice systems are just not set up to be trauma-informed. Uh, the correctional system really doesn't contemplate women and girls and their unique pathways into correctional facilities as well as their unique and distinct needs. Uh, there's less sympathy in general we've seen for adult women and mothers, even when they're um, young mothers behind bars. Um, and without appropriate interventions, we have to recognize that this pipeline fuels adult criminal justice involvement. So when we fail to take the time to examine the root causes of girls' behavior, um, take the time to ask things like, what are you running from? You know, why is it that you missed a month of school? Then we're missing a critical intervention opportunity. Uh, and as a result, not only of these girls not receiving the services they need to get on a path towards healing, but we're also shielding their abusers from accountability. And as we mentioned, uh, these girls without the treatment that they need are let into the community again, which fuels a cycle of incarceration. So how does the pipeline perpetuate violence across society? Well, I think the abuse to prison pipeline really demonstrates an unwillingness to address gendered and sexual violence, and this has really significant uh, implications, um, including hindering the economic opportunity and mobility of survivors of gender-based violence, uh, perpetuating and condoning a culture of exploitation and violence that becomes intergenerational, not only in terms of the perpetrators, but also in terms of the young girls and then their children. Um, it leads to the misallocation of funds that go to criminalize victims of crime instead of focusing on their abusers. And it sends a very clear message to certain victims uh, that they're undeserving and unworthy of our protection. So there are a number of ways that we suggest addressing the pipeline. I think the first uh, really clear objective is to provide comprehensive healthcare services to girls in detention, uh, given their extensive trauma histories. One of the very frustrating things that we see happen across the states, particularly when girls are in the foster care system and then cross over into the juvenile justice system, is that all of their access to healthcare and medical services is cut off. And this is a punitive measure, but obviously from everything that we've talked about today, we know that these girls are in need of services and interventions more um, at this stage more than probably any other point in their lives. It's also critical that we start collecting data and disaggregating that data by factors such as race, uh, gender, ethnicity, offense. This would help us provide a much more comprehensive view of who is actually coming into the system and what it is that's landing them there. Uh, it's also critical to train all detention center staff judges, court personnel, probation officers, and anyone who comes in contact with girls in the juvenile justice system on their unique trauma histories and how to be more trauma informed. And a good example of that um, comes from a case that is actually pretty recent involving a young girl named Janiah McMillan. Uh, and Janiah McMillan is a 15 year old girl who was in the foster care system in Kentucky uh, and she found her way into the juvenile justice system um, again for responding uh, and reacting to trauma. And when she was there, she was asked by a male guard to remove her sweatshirt. Well, Janiah refused to do so. Uh, and as a result, she was placed in a martial arts restraint um, that she was subdued. She was forced to remove her shirt and um, the staff never bothered checking on her. So throughout the course of the night, she was left in her cell and in the morning when they came to look for Janiah, she was actually dead. And so again, this shows uh, how being trauma informed, trying to recognize like given the unique trauma histories of these girls and the pervasive levels of violence and exploitation that so many of them have suffered, it makes perfect sense why a young girl would not want to take off her shirt in front of a male guard. And so just being more mindful and trauma informed in our practices could go a long way towards preserving girls' safety. We also believe that we need to take a gender-informed uh, approach to justice reform conversations. I think right now we're, we're hearing a lot of folks and a lot of interest in providing meaningful criminal justice and juvenile justice reform, but many of these conversations focus on young men and boys uh, and men in general. And so we think it's really important, given the unique pathways of girls and women into the criminal justice system, to take a more gender-nuanced approach. One of the other things we advocate for is screening and identification tools and mechanisms, ideally across all systems that these girls touch, so education as well as juvenile justice, child welfare, and the courts, um, but at a bare minimum, juvenile justice systems so that those children can be identified who have issues and who have histories of trauma and be provided appropriate services in their communities. And of course, promoting alternatives to detention for all survivors of violence, including victims of child sex trafficking. 
Um, look, taking a look at policy change from the big picture perspective, I think this abuse to prison pipeline really shows the urgency and the need of providing comprehensive health care services to marginalized populations and the importance of recognizing trauma and mental health as public health issues uh, and in some places public health crises. Uh, we need to support pathways to employment and stability amongst marginalized populations that are particularly vulnerable to trafficking and sexual exploitation. I think it's incumbent upon all of us to have very honest uh, and direct conversations about the pervasiveness of gender-based violence and sexual violence in particular in our communities and in our nation, which includes the demand for uh, sex with underage girls and its effect not only on girls and women um, directly, but also to the status of women and girls in society. Um, one of the things that I didn't flag in our stats section when we talked about King County and the overrepresentation of girls of color in um, in, in the trafficking populations there, one of the things that we neglected to say is that even though girls of color and African American girls are 43% of all identified trafficking victims in King County, they've also disaggregated their data around buyers by race and gender, and they found that 79% of the buyers in that case were white men. And so I think it's really important when you juxtapose those glaring racial disparities, um, it's something that we really need to address and talk about in terms of who's being disproportionately harmed through sexual exploitation and who's disproportionately fueling that harm. And of course, we need to end practices that criminalize all survivors of violence and instead shift our focus to holding exploiters, abusers, and traffickers accountable in a victim-centered and victim-led way. So now I just want to quickly touch on a campaign that Rights for Girls has launched and, and discuss um, using media and advocacy awareness campaigns to dismantle one particular aspect of the pipeline. So at Rights for Girls, um, we were incredibly frustrated by the fact that for domestic victims of sex trafficking, they were not only being not recognized as victims, but they were actually being incarcerated as child prostitutes. And so we launched this campaign um, to make clear that there's in fact no such thing as a child prostitute, that what we're actually talking about are victims and survivors of commercial rape, and that it's at its core, this is really another form of child sexual abuse. And so we launched the No Such Thing campaign to eliminate the very notion of child prostitute in our language, in our law, and in the media. The goals of the campaign were really simple. We wanted to end the use of this terminology in the media and in the public square, promote policies that end the arrest and incarceration of these youth, uh, uplift and center the experiences and recommendations of survivors themselves, and of course promote deterrence and apprehension of sex buyers who are typically left out of all conversations when you discuss sex trafficking, but who really are the ones fueling the trade in underage girls. So we employed a number of different strategies. Here's a, a few of the things that we did as part of the campaign to really amplify the message. We had a petition, a campaign video. We uh, placed op-eds with uh, various celebrities and influencers um, and created a bunch of digital content. So we had uh, a young woman who was very passionate about this issue, um, a survivor named T. Ortiz Walker Pettigrew, who penned a letter as part of this change.org petition to the Associated Press. And she called on the Associated Press as a media leader to stop using this harmful and incorrect uh, terminology to refer to children like her who had been bought and sold for sex. And she talked about the ways that it did harm not only for her, um, for, for other girls like her, uh, and really called out the fact that the media and the way they discuss issues really shapes how the public perceives them. And so this campaign uh, was very successful. It was shared thousands of times. It garnered over 150,000 signatures, and it ultimately was a success. So um, after about a year, the Associated Press did uh, change their guidelines and encourage all writers and journalists to stop using this terminology to refer to these victims. Here's an example of some artwork, original artwork that we commissioned that was inspired by survivor testimony. Uh, in particular, this was uh, inspired by the poem to the right that was written by a 12-year-old uh, African-American survivor of child sex trafficking from Los Angeles County. Uh, and it's a poem that really discusses the manipulation and betrayal that she felt um, from her trafficker, who she really felt was somebody who she could trust and she could um, love and care for her. 
Um, and we try to incorporate art and creative content um, when we talk about these types of issues as a way of highlighting the resiliency of these survivors. And so this girl um, completed uh, a program, uh, was doing really, really well the last time I saw her, which was uh, last November. Uh, and so we showcased this type of artwork at various galleries, uh, at various events, um, to really highlight the girl's resiliency. We took out a number of ads and billboards in high traffic areas um, to really reframe the issue of child sex trafficking, not as prostitution, not as vice, not as sex work, but really talk about it as another form of sexual abuse. And so these ads in particular made clear that if you're buying a teenage girl for sex, you are a child rapist. You're not a John. Um, you're actually committing what would be statutory rape in any other situation. Uh, and as part of the campaign, we often say that there should be no difference between abusing a child and paying to abuse a child. And unfortunately, because of the contradictions uh, and the misinformation around domestic child sex trafficking, there too often is. And so these are some examples of the digital content and memes that we created. They've been shared, uh, I think they've made hundreds of uh, millions of impressions on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And these are just a couple of examples of the messaging that we've tried to get out there around the No Such Thing campaign. So a quick snapshot of the timeline and the successes of the campaign. We launched in 2015 and soon thereafter we were able to work with our partners in Los Angeles County and we deliberately focused on LA County being that it's the largest county in the country. And we were able to get the LA County Sheriff Jim McDonnell to commit to a policy of ending the arrest of minors for prostitution offenses in that entire county. Um, and so that was a huge success and, and it was something that took um, several months but we were very proud that um, the sheriff actually saw this issue as a victim and saw these kids as victims of child abuse. And I will say that survivors in California were very instrumental to getting that point home. In April 2016 was when the Associated Press actually released their updated style guide discouraging writers from using child prostitute and related terms to describe this population. Um, and then after that, we had been in talks after the LA County success with a number of our partners and allies uh, throughout the state of California who were very impassioned about expanding our success in LA County to the entire state. And so soon um, there was a bill that was introduced, SB 1322, which was dubbed the No Such Thing Bill. Um, and this was something that was really uh, taken and, and led by the advocates on the ground in LA, um, using our messaging and using our some of our uh, content and um, digital media. But what they were able to do was get this law passed through both chambers in California, and ultimately it was signed by the governor in September 2016. Uh, as of January 2017, the law is now fully in effect, which means that no minor under the age of 18 in the entire state of California can be arrested or prosecuted for prostitution offenses. And so we were very um, proud of the success in California. We feel like California has often been a leader on a number of different social justice issues. And so we felt if we could do this in such a large state, we could take incremental steps and, and replicate um, these types of policies in smaller jurisdictions. And so next, we're going to be moving the No Such Thing campaign to the southern United States. Um, we're looking at uh, the areas in and around Atlanta, Georgia. We have a number of partners on the ground there that are engaged in this type of policy reform. And we really believe that this is a key racial gender justice issue for girls of color in the United States. And then finally, I just want to uh, flag some of the federal efforts that are underway that could potentially uh, dismantle aspects of this pipeline. Uh, over the last couple of years, there's been a renewed interest around juvenile justice reform in particular on the Hill. Uh, this is a bill, the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act, or the JJDPA, has been around for uh, decades. It was first passed in 1974, I believe. And what it does is it sets certain core requirements and standards for the states to follow with respect to juvenile justice and the youth in their systems. And so this bill has been languishing for about 15 years. It has not been reauthorized, but we have seen newfound uh, bipartisan interest and bicameral interest, which has been very positive, um, to renew and reauthorize this bill this year. And so some of the provisions that are included uh, in the House bill that was introduced and actually passed through the Committee of Jurisdiction yesterday and will now be headed to the entire House for a vote, um, it includes provisions like screening youth upon intake, 
for things like sex trafficking, as well as other forms of violence and sexual abuse, and then diverting those children into appropriate community-based programs. Um, it ends the valid court order exception or the VCO loophole. So this is uh, the provision that basically allows for the secure confinement of kids who are committing those very innocuous offenses that are really just behaviors that are defined by the perpetrator's age. Things like running away, curfew violations, truancy, things that no adult could actually be arrested for. Um, the VCO exception has allowed for status offenders, kids who commit any one of those types of offenses to be securely confined and locked up. Uh, and in many states, this is a tremendous problem. In places like Arkansas, for example, more than 50% of their incarcerated youth are status offenders. I mean, is this, not only is it an inhumane way to treat these types of issues and that are highly correlated with trauma, but it's also a really uh, cost inefficient way of dealing with these issues. I mean, each child, to house one child in Arkansas, for example, for one year in a detention facility is $70,000. I mean, investing those types of um, money up front in terms of community-based programs are usually around two to five thousand dollars. So it's not even cost effective. It's really just something that is uh, fueling a cycle of victimization, re-traumatization, and uh, inevitably adult criminal justice involvement. So this would be a huge victory for girls who are overrepresented, obviously, uh, because of their trauma histories among the population of status offenders. The bill also promotes gender responsive programming. It appoints um, an expert in sexual abuse and sexual exploitation to the state advisory boards in each state. Uh, it encourages strategies for reducing racial and ethnic disparities in the juvenile justice system, and it ends the shackling of pregnant girls. Um, these are one of the most harmful conditions of confinement that we see, and again, it shows how there's no gender lens when applied to the types of procedures that are implemented in uh, criminal justice and juvenile justice systems where pregnant girls were being shackled and subject to both um, wrist restraints, ankle restraints, and belly chains uh, at various forms of their pregnancy, and sometimes during labor and delivery and postpartum. And so this legislation that's currently pending now would address all of these issues and a number of other factors. Um, it's really fortunate that we have a federal vehicle to be able to address state juvenile justice system across the states. Uh, obviously, the adult system is much more complicated, and, and that would have to be done on a state-by-state -state basis. So for those who are interested in getting involved and advocating, um, JJDPA is a huge priority um, for uh, a number of different advocates who work on issues affecting this population. So just in closing, I know that we mentioned there's many important conversations that are happening today at a national level, at a state and local level, um, talking about the importance of racial justice, talking about uh, the need to end mass incarceration, uh, and talking about the need for critical juvenile and criminal justice reform. But of course, many of these conversations really are, are discussed with men and boys in mind. And so we feel that the abuse to prison pipeline reality in the lives of so many of our girls urges that girls, and particularly girls of color, not only be contemplated, but even centered as part of these conversations. Uh, in our work in advocacy, we often say that when we create and craft policies that center the needs of our most vulnerable, our most marginalized young girl, um, what we call the last girl, then it's clear that everyone else in society's needs are often met as well. And so with that, uh, I just want to thank you for taking the time to listen. Thank you for your interest in this issue. And uh, I'm, we'll leave it open for questions. Hi, my name is Faith, and I have a question about the no such thing laws. Um, what I'm curious to, A, what the procedure is now, instead of arresting girls for prostitution, are they being given services or are they just like being ignored? And additionally, um, girls who are trafficked as minors when they turn 18, if they're still being trafficked, does this law no longer apply to them and are they then subject to being criminalized still for the same reason? So those are two very, very good and important questions. Um, the first um, 
really exemplifies why we focused on both LA County and then California in general, not only because it's the largest county and that California is so influential, but because there were amazing advocates that we've had longstanding partnerships with that have been doing important work at the ground level. So the whole reason why we were able to pass a law this expansive in California was because they had been implementing and had piloted what was known as a first responder protocol um, for child sex trafficking in a number of different jurisdictions and counties, and now they've been able to replicate that statewide. So what they do in California is when a first responder, typically law enforcement, encounters a, a young child who's suspected or um, a certain to be a victim of domestic child sex trafficking, they call a hotline, which is operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they're immediately connected with a victim advocate who will meet them anywhere they are within 90 minutes. And so that allows for a non-punitive response. Um, obviously, in a lot of states that don't have robust services, they don't have funding, California put a ton of funding into addressing uh, the issue of commercial sexual exploitation. Um, in places where that's not an option, it becomes much more difficult to get a law as expansive as California's, which we would call a full immunity statute because children are immune from both arrest and prosecution. Uh, in some states, we've seen them still allow for the arrest so that the child can then be taken into and referred and diverted into services. But in those situations, the child still has an arrest record. Um, there's still court involved. Um, you know, in, in juvenile justice speak, we call that net widening. And ideally, the gold standard is to get where we are with California across the board. But being realistic, because of the dearth of services and funding around this issue in, in most states and at the federal level compared to other forms of violence, um, it's been very difficult to see that uh, throughout the states. But that's why we're really invested in using the campaign messaging and allowing others to spread the word and start to kind of build those grassroots movement. And where we can be helpful is in helping to um, get them to whatever they define as success in their jurisdiction. And we certainly have no interest in coming into jurisdictions from DC and saying like, we're here to solve your trafficking population, but however we can build relationships with survivors, advocates, uh, and local lawmakers to, to get this done um, uh, to, the, to the full extent that we can is, is a success. Uh, to your other point, um, this is something that we, we often talk about in our work in advocacy because the data and the information that we have on the commercial sex trade as a whole, you know, um, people in prostitution, is that the vast majority of them first entered as children. Um, but unfortunately, there is this perception, right, that once clock strikes 18, it's an empowered career choice. And so that's something that we work very hard to um, reframe. We work very hard to dispel. Uh, we do a lot of trainings with judges across the country. We're a longtime partner with the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, where we do judicial institutes uh, across the country. Our next one is in June. Uh, we just had one in March in Austin. Um, and what we do is we train judges on how to identify these kids in their courtroom. And over time, as we've been getting more and more adult criminal judges, we've been able to connect those dots for them, that it's not appropriate for any victim of sexual exploitation, any prostituted person, whether they're a child, whether they're a male, whether they're trans, gender nonconforming, female, um, it's not appropriate for any of them to be incarcerated in our view. Uh, we really view prostitution and sexual exploitation as another form of gender-based violence and we we'll believe and, and what we advocate for is those individuals being able to be provided the same uh, services and exit strategies and provided with viable options instead of kind of being um, condemned to the sex trade. So that's our position on that issue. Yes. I have a, I guess, I guess a twofold question at the same. Um, you mentioned that African American girls account for, I think you said about 68% of uh, the female population, prison population, yes? And that they only account for about 10% of felonies, yes? Is this, um, would you consider this to be targeting uh, based on, on on the on police departments or in the judicial system first that was the first sure. question the second question is I'm curious as to know why you didn't mention um, John Walsh in your reporting or is he a source in your in your reporting so to your first question yeah absolutely racial and implicit biases are a huge issue um, they're a big reason why 
people of color in general are overrepresented amongst prison populations, um, but they're also a reason why they're disproportionately targeted as victims of human trafficking. Um, what we were trying to mention is that they're marginalized not only in their communities through a number of different forms of adversity, but then they have to face the added uh, vulnerabilities of being a person of color appearing before a judge, right? They're getting referred. So for instance, a young girl in foster care who runs away, if she's picked up by a cop and she isn't from the suburbs and she looks a certain way and she has tattoos and she, um, because she's traumatized, is, is deemed aggressive or unladylike, which are all terms that we've heard both law enforcement and judges use, they're gonna decide to make an arrest for running away, whereas you know most of us who come from um, you know more stable communities or potentially from the suburbs would never even see an arrest for truancy. I mean, these are the kids who have school resource officers in their schools who decide based on very subjective factors to make the arrest for this child for being truant, but not this child for being truant. Um, so the, the what is the American government doing about are, are they investigating these referrals? Yeah, so as part of that federal law, there is a huge push. Like in, as part of the JJDPA, it has uh, four core requirements, and one of the requirements is to work actively and aggressively to reduce racial and ethnic disparities. Because this is something that, you know, our federal policymakers would be happy to deny. But it's so pervasive and extensive that they can no longer deny it. And so that is one of the core requirements. And it's a condition of state funding. Um, and these states have to basically show the strategies that they're using to employ. But I think it's a multifaceted approach. It's not only targeting the police and educating the police, but it's also educating these judges and checking them on racial biases. So so as part of our judicial institutes, we have a whole section, a two-day section, talking about cultural competency, talking about um, the role of checking your privilege and understanding your own biases and how they affect how you treat certain children in the courtroom. Um, a lot of these girls are getting policed for things that are completely tied to them, their femininity. Um, gender non-conforming girls in particular uh, are overrepresented also amongst uh, juvenile justice populations for similar reasons. And so it, it's a huge problem. It's an absolutely huge problem, and it's it's so huge that I don't think uh, even Republicans would deny it. I mean, they're some of the ones leading the charge on this effort, though, um, yeah, it's, it's going to take multi-disciplinary uh, response to address. And then John Walsh, so you mean from the founder of National Center for Missing and Exploited Children? Um, I read this story. Um, he got involved in this, um, you know, he's like a mercenary, you know, and he, some, someone killed his son, and he became really involved about getting, you know, cleaning up street crime and all this other kind of stuff. And he was, he was at one point, I remember, he was really heavy. He, he and Ronald, I think it was Ronald Reagan, um, if I'm not mistaken, might have been another president, but they signed, they signed what they called the John Walsh Act. Yes. And so they had all this thing about... Um, uh, Adam so started, Walsh, yeah, they, based they on his son. The, the sexual predators list and yes. all that stuff. So, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm curious as to why you didn't mention so the Adam Walsh Act, um, it was named after his son. That's kind of the legislation. Uh, it's pretty controversial. I know some groups you know, ardently support it. Uh, other groups like ours um, kind of stayed clear from some of that. What it does is to place individuals on the sex offender registry. Uh, and sex offender registries are state registries that uh, individuals are put on who are deemed to be you know, sexual predators um, in a court, and I think judges make that uh, distinction. And John Walsh, as you said, his son went missing and was ultimately murdered, and so he and his wife um, worked to create what's known as the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, this is now a huge NGO. They are federally funded. They're kind of a, a hybrid. They're part federal, part uh, nonprofit, uh, and they're the ones who really deal with missing and exploited children, so they're kind of a national clearinghouse. They collect all the data. So for instance, when uh, girls go missing, the girls who went missing in DC, as an example, we required as part of a law that we passed a couple of years ago to reform the child welfare system that every state child welfare facility who had girls missing from care or any youth missing from care report those kids missing to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children because let's say uh, a young girl goes missing from DC and she shows up in Michigan, NCMEC has access to all of that data across the states, um, but they are a monolith. I mean, they're a huge 
NGO, uh, and they support a number of those different measures that um, are very nuanced. And so we, we didn't support that particular piece of legislation, but I didn't talk about it in the sense that um, I was trying to focus on the experience of sexual abuse and victimization of girls rather than talking about the girls as predators. Um, so. Oh, no worries. I mean, I think I, I, I would have, be happy to do a presentation on, on predators. So I would, I would be happy because I do think uh, particularly sex buyers are largely left out of any conversation that we have around sex trafficking and prostitution in general. And when you look at those demographics um, compared to the demographics of those who are disproportionately exploited and disproportionately criminalized, which are always women and girls of color, both in prostitution and uh, child sex trafficking, and compare them to the buyers, they're disproportionately um, white, you know, middle-aged, educated men with means. And so we've done a lot of work to address that. There's a couple federal bills that we passed a couple years ago that would fine such individuals uh, about $5,000. They would be deposited into a, a fund that would then finance services and victim uh, grant programs. So there are things that we're doing around that issue. I just um, I felt like 40 minutes was a lot of talking at you, so I wanted to spare you, but I'm happy to follow up, and my contact information is here if you, you want to hear more about any of that. So you mentioned this a little bit from the first question, and I was wondering, when you look at the legislation, did you have legislators who were concerned about the girls not being arrested because, therefore, it might increase the trafficking of them by those who are exploiting them? Yeah, so actually we had a, our own uh, it, little uh, foray with uh, fake news. So once we passed this law in California, we had a very you know, Republican member of their assembly do an op-ed that essentially went viral talking about how advocates had legalized child prostitution in the state of California. And so not really recognizing the nuance between decriminalizing um, children for an offense that they can't legally be committing and correcting that contradiction of laws and instead treating them like other victims of child abuse. We do consistently hear the concern around arrest and that's something uh, that we really hammer with the judges that we train because even if they're concerned about you know traffickers targeting these kids, the traffickers are following what the demand requires. And so the demand wants underage girls, wants you know whatever, that's what they're following. They're simply meeting what the demand requires. Um, but we felt like it was an injustice. You know, do we criminalize victims of statutory rape? Do we criminalize victims of interfamilial abuse and incest? So it didn't make sense to us that our response was to criminalize victims of child sex trafficking. And we use uh, those examples as well as, you know, domestic violence as an example. I mean, does it make sense? I mean, it seems a little bit paternalistic to say, we're gonna arrest you and bog you down with these records that are gonna totally screw up the rest of your life because it's, it's safer than putting you back on the streets. So instead, we try to work with those communities, um, help them advocate for additional resources, create you know, creative funding streams, um, either through victim you know, cr criminal fines um, and other sorts of avenues to be able to create the network of services so that there are alternatives. So you don't have a situation um, where you have police officers seeing children clearly being exploited and driving by because they're like, oh, well, it's decriminalized. So it's very important. And that's not a law that we would have advocated for in another state um, that so wasn't there yet. But it does come up. It does come up a lot. Can you step closer to the mic? Oh, sorry. Just a quick question. Are there or is it even possible to have any statistics on the traffickers as far as uh, their racial identities? Are there more white, more black, or whatever? So we do have some federal data that's based on the federal criminal statute um, that's used to prosecute traffickers. And over the last several years, we've seen that those individuals who are criminalized for trafficking offenses have been disproportionately black and brown men. Um, however, we would argue it's because the law isn't being equitably applied. Under the federal law, which we made clear in, in the law that I mentioned a couple years ago that fined um, these perpetrators and put their, their fine into a victim services fund, we actually argued that the federal law applies equally to traffickers as well as buyers. And why is it uh, given the demographics that we know, we know there's white traffickers. We know in, in, in Indian country, there's Native American on Native American crime. Most of the trafficking that exists there um, are different demographics. So it's not 
just black and brown men who are committing acts of trafficking, but they are being disproportionately criminalized for it, which again goes to the racial biases in the system. And so one of the arguments that we made was that from a racial justice perspective, the federal criminal law has to be applied equally to buyers of child sex as well as traffickers. And so that's something that went into effect in 2015. And so it'll be interesting to see what the new um, Bureau of Justice Statistics data is in terms of those offenses that will be disaggregated by you know, soliciting, patronizing versus um, trafficking. Okay. So with regard to the training of folks, when you're talking about the criminal justice system, have you guys reached out to any of the prosecution, the, like the Commonwealth attorneys, the district attorneys, because those are a lot of times the people who form the charges? Yes. So we have worked with um, the National District Attorneys Association, NDAA, um, the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys, and Equitas, who I think has been the strongest on this issue. They are an association of attorneys, prosecutors that focus on crimes related to sexual and domestic violence. And so they've done a number of really interesting um, webinars and trainings focused on child trafficking and, and human trafficking prosecutions in general. Um, right now, we are in the process of finalizing and putting out a report um, as a tool for prosecutors to be able to take advantage of some of the existing child victim protection uh, witness laws. Uh, we know that in cases of, again, interfamilial abuse, children are able to testify in court with closed circuit television. So they don't have to be in the courtroom with their abuser. Um, but none of these protections are being used for, again, trafficking survivors. And so we're in the process of releasing that report that we hope will be a guide for a number of these prosecutors to be able to take advantage of those laws to protect other victims of child abuse, and then other kind of uh, legal strategies, things like forfeiture by wrongdoing statutes, ways to really um, balance the defendant's Sixth Amendment right to confront their accuser with balancing the safety, you know, security, and not re-traumatizing a child victim in particular of uh, sexual exploitation. So we are in touch with those groups. They have varying levels of interest and ability uh, on these issues, but um, at the federal level, we are disseminating tons of guidance through DOJ uh, and other means to make clear that at least with respect to human trafficking prosecutions, they can't keep ignoring the demand, right? Until we start addressing the demand for commercial sex, which is fueling sex trafficking as well as prostitution, we're never going to solve the issue of human trafficking. You can go after the supply and the traffickers as much as you want, but you're never going to solve the issue until men feel some sort of risk or accountability in going online or going on the street and uh, buying uh, underage girls and others for sex. And so that's something that we're continuing to work with those groups on. To what degree does your organization look at what's going on on university and college campuses? Uh, because there, I know of a case of very intelligent males uh, who would use the honor code with some uh, system which some universities have, which essentially is self-governance of student behavior, and use it uh, in retaliation for a girl that did not, um, I guess, favorably receive his advances. And upon that occurring, files an honor code violation for cheating, et cetera. And the girl is victimized during the whole investigation, 23 interviews of all sorts of people, accusers, defenders, taking over a year of her time while she's trying to be a student. And there's no repercussion, even though the filing was in bad faith. Mm -hmm. But as you know, most young women do not want to face harassment, sexual abuse, uh, especially at the initial state. They're very vulnerable. And in this case, a prestigious university has an honor code that a very clever male has decided to use to retaliate against his sexual advances towards someone that rejected him and then proceeded to have others follow up and claim that nervous behavior during an exam is indicative of cheating. And then the university administrators 
are told, even if the nervous behavior is, in fact, uh, witnessed, mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with cheating. And yet, upon being told that nervous behavior, twitching, looking to side to side, is not evidence of cheating, they still went forward with a year-long investigation. I mean, my question is, is your organization or any organization looking at the sophisticated um, psychological tools that educated, uh, you know, young men are using against women who are in the universities? So I will say our organization is not. Um, our focus has really been on our most marginalized populations. Um, but there are a number of allies that we have who do work on campus sexual assault and some of these other issues. We work with a number of male anti-violence organizations, uh, groups like Men Can Stop Rape that are fantastic. They're local here in DC. Um, groups like A Call to Men um, that are based out of New York, but again, do trainings across universities, uh, elementary schools, and uh, the whole gamut. And what they do is try to foster uh, what's known as healthy masculinity and try to really attack and um, scrutinize what's been the dominant form of masculinity, which they describe as toxic masculinity, that fuels exactly this type of harassing and predatory behavior, uh, often at women and girls' expense. And so we haven't looked at those issues. It's not dissimilar from what we see in, in other forms of intimate partner violence and domestic violence, where um, you know individuals with potentially more authority or more clout um, are able to kind of subjugate and harass uh, and intimidate their victims who are most often you know female or people with uh, lesser power or influence and so I think at the school level this is the type of thing that uh, they would really benefit from I know men can stop rape in particular does workshops on these issues um, they uh, did one this weekend at uh, University of DC, and I know they work at Howard, and they work at a number of different um, schools and universities throughout the district and nationally. So that's a group that I would suggest um, you flagging this for. I think they would be really great on being able to at least um, walk through what some steps would be in terms of talking to school administrators about how to address those types of concerns. And with that, I'm going to ask all of you to join me in thanking Yasmin for coming today. Yasmin, I'm going to actually ask one last question for you to tell all of us. You've, you've talked about ways that uh, legislation that is in process, et cetera. Um, you're, you have a group of an active student body sitting in front of you. Um, what advice would you give to them? Well, I think it's important to not only spread the awareness, but get involved in your local community and really, um, as young people, prioritize these types of issues in your own communities. Um, I was mentioning uh, to Dania that DC is now starting a, a really robust girls coalition. Um, we're going to be involved. Um, we're going to be focusing on this issue, and it's, it's run by um, or going to be led by the Washington Area Women's Foundation. And I know that a number of the women's foundations throughout the country, including New York, uh, Miami, Minnesota, and several others are taking steps to really look and examine uh, the needs of girls and girls of color in particular. And I think that um, in our work, they're just too often invisible. So I think getting engaged in your communities around issues of violence against girls, getting involved around uh, legislative reform and making your voices heard um, as we do you know, around election time when things like health care and other things are pending, um, it's important for these lawmakers to hear from their constituents that things like this are a priority. I mean, literally, the juvenile justice bill got held up in the Senate last year because of one senator, uh, a senator from Arkansas, Tom Cotton. And you know, he, I feel like they truly just did not understand why people were making such a fuss and cared about this issue and this population. So I think making your voices heard and recognizing your own power uh, in terms of being able to organize and, and get involved in your local community, either here or back home, uh, and being involved in these types of issues because, you know, they're the next generation of being able to address and, and prioritize um, not only the needs of young women and girls, but how our youth will be treated in society. So. Um, you can follow us on, on our social media outlets. We're always kind of talking about upcoming events, briefings, um, conferences. 
and appearances as well as you know getting engaged in terms of legislative uh, battles uh, that we're always fighting. There's going to be a trafficking bill that's also up for reauthorization this year where we're going to try to make, again, uh, more equitably applied to all perpetrators um, and to protect all victims of crime, both adult and minors. So um, with that, I, you know, I want to thank you for, for the opportunity. It was a real pleasure.